I'm glad you all made it because, you know, with the rain and the thunder, I didn't know if we were going to make it. I uh, was driving over here, and there was uh, floodwaters all over uh, our part of town. And I text my son and said, hey, let Daddy know if I don't make it to church, he better be ready in season and out of season. Amen? <laughs> Amen? Again, tonight um, is going to be our message series. is not part of a, uh, a longer series. Uh, tonight's message is a standalone message, and it's a message titled Pressing In for the Finish. Pressing In for the Finish. Hate to break it to you, but Christmas is about four months away. Hello, somebody. You know, we started the year with Pastor Kent declaring a great word over our church family. He said this year is going to be our breakout year, our breakthrough year, amen? And we started this year with all the momentum. We started with, you know, that creativity. We started with uh, just good uh, aspirations, amen? And how's that going? <laughs> right? It's tough to stay motivated. You know, right about now is when, you know, religious people get really, really irritating to you. <laughs> Amen? Right about now, uh, we're not dreaming anymore. We're not thriving. We're just trying to survive. Amen? I'm just trying to not get fired. Amen? I'm just trying to put some food on the table. Amen? We're just surviving. Right about now, uh, ministries, there's a lot of, you know, beefing going on. We're family. It's the truth. And even in your household, there's a lot of beefing going on right now at this time of year. Right? And the only thing that has you not killing your, your spouse is the last episode of uh, CSI. <laughs> you're, you're, you're trying to think of all the ways you're going to get caught. <laughs> you know, it's hard to keep persevering. It's hard to have the momentum in life when disappointment keeps knocking the wind out of you. Come on, somebody. You know, uh, this medal right here, it's a marathon medal. Right here, it's a marathon medal. Um, what, 23 and a half miles, I think. Um, and this medal, actually, I wish it was mine, uh, but it, it actually isn't. You know, uh, it's my husband's Pastor Bam's. It's his medal. You know, I'm more of a, you know, 100-meter dash kind of, kind of killer. <laughs> I, I'm not about all that 23 miles or whatever. I tell Pastor Bam, if we went in a race and it was 100 meters, I would blow you out of the water. You would eat dust. <laughs> but, you know, marathon runners, they, they, um, they're amazing. You know, they run and they train. And, you know, in the last part of the marathon, you know, typically in the last eight miles, six miles, their legs get wobbly. You know, their mind starts to mess with them. They're pretty beat up. They're bust up. Yet they're not willing to give up. I asked Pastor Bam, what kept you going, you know, when it was hard? And he was like, I didn't come all this way for nothing. You know, especially when we would go to his marathons, we would go as a family. You know, uh, our Samoan family, we'd have to, we don't rent like a small little van. Uh, we rent like a, you know, 15-passenger seat type of van. So he had an audience that he just couldn't give up. Amen? And this is the part of the race where all the intellect, all the reasoning does you no good. You know, all the tired muscles, the crowds, they don't do you any good. They, they're not going to give you any air. You know, some of us are running our life like a, a, a marathon. And a lot of us want to give up, if we're honest. Amen? A lot of us want to give up at this point in, in our race. You know, the last part of the marathon is when the only thing that's left is your heart and your guts. Amen? Come on. Amen? Amen? And so maybe you're, you're in life right now and you want to give up and things aren't going your way and the devil has knocked the wind out of you and you've gotten some setbacks. Listen, when the devil sets you back, no, you are getting a proper position so you can catapult back at the devil. Amen? You're just getting your stance and maybe you're at a place in your life right now in a season when the streams of counsel are, are drying up and you're looking for signs and they're not there, amen? And, and, and you're just thinking, if I just gave up my faith, if I just roll over on the side of the road and stop running, nobody would notice. 
So right now you're saying, am I going to make it? You know, I remember one season, um, I don't remember what it was or what I was going through, but I just remember the agony and the pain. <laughs> I remember the anxiety, and I remember in our um, uh, bedroom, I was laying on the floor face down, just full on face down, and Pastor Bam walks in and says, what's, what's going on? And I said, I'm not going to make it. And he's like, to where? And I'm like, tomorrow. <laughs> and he kicks me on the side. What kind of pastor are you? He kicks me on the side and says, get up, woman. Don't act like you don't have Christ. Hello, somebody. Hello, somebody. Maybe this year hasn't been all that it's cracked up to be. You know, maybe you, you, you remember the promise or the promise was spoken over to you, and now you're starting to question the prophecy, starting to question if God really can do what he said he can do. Now, I'm here to wake you up, church, all right? Do you have what it takes to press into the finish? I'm here to remind you tonight, family. Can, I give, can, can you give me permission to give you a spiritual kick in the side? <laughs> Listen, I don't care. I'm giving it anyway. <laughs> Get back in the race. Get back in the game. Who cares if the clock is ticking against you? All right, I know a guy that can hold back the sun. In fact, he did hold back the sun in the Bible for Joshua during the battle. I know a guy who cares if the, your, your victory is in the decision of somebody else. I know a guy that has a gavel that trumps every other gavel. He trumps the gavel of the justice system, trumps the gavel of the White House system, trumps the gavel of the school system. He is a sovereign God who has not fallen off his throne. Are you willing to press in? Some of you aren't running like you used to. Some of you aren't training like you used to. Some of you aren't praying like you used to. Some of you are praying and words are going up, but the cry of the heart of God is not going up, and you wonder why things aren't coming down. Some of you are not watching and working out like you used to, working out your faith. God is setting us in battle position, new hope. Don't give up now. You know, oftentimes we think that when, when God sends us to battle, we're going to be swooped up. We're, we're going to be swooped up. We're going to be built up. We're going to be encouraged. We're going to have um, all this kind of, you know, faith. Listen, we're not transformers. All right? Well, some of y'all are. <laughs> Church by day and bumblebee by night. Hello, somebody. <laughs> listen, mount up, New Hope, Las Vegas. Press the, hey, listen, come back. Come on, come back. Some of y'all, your minds are in the clubs right now. Come back to church. You're pressing. A bullet number one, let struggle produce destiny and not stagnancy. Let struggle produce destiny, not stagnancy. Listen, struggle will always produce two things. It's your choice what the outcome is going to be. Is it going to be destiny or is it going to be stagnancy? Are you going to be mad at God? Or are you going to continue to pursue God? Many of us throw in the towel because we think at this point in our walk, at this point in the year, we think that we need to be at the next level by now. But what we don't realize is that struggle sometimes hide the fact that we are in the next level. Listen, the devil never changes. He just changes his form. He uses the same tactics that he did back then. Why? Because they work. Let your struggle produce destiny. Let it catapult you forward. And we think, we look at struggle and we think, man, this is not, you know, the, the, maybe this is not God's will. Maybe, you know, I took the wrong turn. Don't you for once believe that. Know that the presence of God is with you. And know that if you're moving with his heart, there is no wrong decision you can make if you align it with his word, if you align it with his will. Amen? And so we look at our struggle and we think, man, this is not um, the race that I should be in because of why it doesn't look like promotion, it doesn't look like success, it doesn't look like victory, victory. It looks like struggle and opposition. The fact that you are struggling tells me that there is a victory ahead. 
the very fact that there is opposition in your life and things are hard for you to press through is that there is a destiny on the other end. Listen, the devil never, ever attacks your presence. He attacks your future. He attacks what you're going to be. He attacks what you're going to do. He attacks the, you now so that you don't bring people to Christ. Press in for the finish. I want you to look to your neighbor and say, I'm still in the game. All right, all right, all right. Come back in, come back in. And some of us are not fighting like we used to fight. Some of us are not believing like we used to believe. Some of us, our vision has gotten uh, uh, blurred. Or we lost that clear vision. You started strong and now you're feeble. Your legs are tired. We look at struggle and, and, and we start to settle. We think this is the finish line, but it ain't the finish line. You know, we start to settle and we start to welcome people in our circles that aren't good for us. We start to welcome things in our circle that take us away from our destiny, amen? Sometimes those things are other females. <laughs> Sometimes those things are other males. Sometimes those things are other things, uh, jobs and desires for money that aren't aligned with God's will. You can't let it take you from your destiny, amen? amen. And God is asking you right now, how bad do you want this thing? Some of us, we expect God just to give it to us. Just give it to me, Lord. I'm called. Give it to me. Are you willing to break out of some circles with, for this thing? Are you willing to lose some friends for this thing? Are you willing to be chastised by the media for this thing? Are you willing to be dragged into the courthouse for this thing? Are you willing to fight for this thing? Are you willing to go to the next mile for this thing? You started with a crowd and all of a sudden you by yourself. But listen, Jesus is always with you. Amen. And even in those moments where he has to step away so that you can grow and you can stretch, he's just a stone throws away. The Bible said that when he went up to the mountain um, with his three disciples, um, Peter, James, and John, that he was just a stone throws away. And he was still there, amen? So you start to question yourself. But God is really just setting us up for battle, setting us up in for motion, um, uh, and, uh, and the struggle looks like it's going to kill us. Child, you're going to survive. All right? Amen? And so I'm just going to uh, paraphrase a, a, a story. We're going to be uh, talking from the book of um, uh, Samuel, 1 Samuel, and we're going to be talking about David um, here. So let me see. My notes are all over the place. So we're going to be talking about David. And I love David because David is, has that underdog spirit. All right. If, if it's one story that a believer or non-believer knows, they know the story of David, who the, was a shepherd boy who took down Goliath. Amen. And David is known as the man after God's heart, an anointing that is so amazing. And before David uh, was anointed, the prophet Samuel um, was mourning over uh, Saul. Saul was a king and he lost the favor of God. And so Samuel was mourning, um, uh, you know, that. That, that time period of the children of Israel. And so when Samuel was mourning, God basically tells him, you know, suck it up. You know, how long are you going to mourn over Saul? And I want you to, he's been rejected over reigning over the, for Israel. And so he said, I want you to go and anoint a new king. And, um, and so uh, Saul says, well, are you crazy? If I go and anoint, Samuel says, are you crazy? If I go and anoint this king, the current king who is Saul is going to kill me. And, and so God says, don't worry about it. You know, just tell him you're going to do a sacrifice, and I want you to invite Jesse and his sons. And the Bible goes on to say that, so uh, Samuel comes, and he tells Jesse, so we're going to have this sacrifice. I want you to put up all your sons here in front of me. So Jesse brings up his sons, and Samuel goes, and the word of God says that the anointing oil uh, would pour out when the, the chosen one, the anointed one who is supposed to be king and lead Israel um, would be before Samuel. And so picture this. All the sons are lining, lining up. And so Samuel goes up and starts to pour the anointing. Nothing. Then he goes after each one. After each one. 
each one. And the Bible says that when he got to the last one, that David says, I mean, that Samuel says to Jesse, do you have any more sons? Isn't it so interesting that he questions Jesse before he questions God? When we go through circumstances, when we go through struggles, we always question God, who is all sovereign, before we ever question our, 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 our circumstance. Is that correct? So in your, in, your, um, in your notes, they have the scripture up there. I'm like all over the place. Devil, you will not get ahead of me tonight. Amen? Amen. Amen. You will not get ahead of me tonight. So we're going to go into our scripture, um, and it's going to be point number one. It's not your choice. He chooses you. It's not your choice. He chooses you. So often we question our circumstance. Um, we, we question God versus questioning our circumstance. And so uh, I love what Samuel does. He tells Jesse, don't you have another son? And then Jesse goes, well, yeah, he's feeding the sheep. And then he calls him over there, and then he brings him. And then Jesse, I mean, and then Samuel pours the oil, and then it starts to flow over Jesse, um, Jesse's son, David. And so it's not your choice. He chooses you. And so the word of God. God says in Samuel 16, 12, verses 13, And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. You know, I love that David didn't have to position himself to a place where God would notice him. And some of us were like, you know what, if I could just uh, get, get mentored by the right person, <laughs> if, I get to, if I could just read the right book, if I could just fast enough. Um, and I love that David didn't, didn't do that. And I love that Samuel, when Samuel was done with this great, glorious um, anointing ceremony, he packs up and leaves. He's like, bye, Felicia. <laughs> He packs up and leaves. He goes back. And, you know, if that was us, we'd be like, what's going on? Amen. What's happening? Let's go back into the chorus. <laughs> and here's the truth. You don't have to get the attention of man in order to get the attention of God. Listen, God sees you all the way in the back row. God sees you in the line of the grocery store counting how much dollars you have and if you have enough to make the bill. God sees you. He sees your heart. You don't have to position yourself in a place so that you can get the favor of God. David didn't choose. God chose him. Amen? I love it that he didn't have to get the attention of man. I mean, Jesus grabbed people while they were fishing. He grabbed men while they were fishing. He grabbed women while they were getting water from the well. He grabbed women while they were getting stoned. You know, David didn't see the destiny come into fruition until much later. The Bible says there's seed time and harvest. What we forget that between seed and harvest is this thing called time. <laughs> time that's in the middle of that scripture it's time and we think they're two separate things they're three separate things amen a picture the scene the best prophecy of your life spoken over you and then you go back to feeding the sheep what you go back to bad bad bullet number two anointed does not mean now anointed does not mean now so after Solomon anoints David, David goes back to tending the sheep. Uh, Samuel, I'm sorry. After Samuel anoints David, David goes back to tending the sheep. But just by coincidence, the king started to get a distressed spirit over him. Saul started to get stressed out. Y'all going to make me lose my mind up in here, up in here. So Saul starts to lose his mind all of a sudden. And so Saul says, is there anybody, you know, in the land that can come and, you know, play music? And they said, yeah, there is this one guy and is uh, the son of Jesse. Out of all the people, how does Jesse's son get that favor? 
Amen. You don't have to get the attention of God. And so um, the scripture says in 1 Samuel 16, 22, 23, then Saul sent to Jesse saying, please let David stand before me. He has found favor in my sight. And it was so whenever the spirit was, um, the spirit from God was upon Saul, that David would take a harp and play it with his hand. Then Saul would become refreshed and well, and the distressing spirit will depart from him. And so, just to recap here what's happening. So, uh, Samuel has this pity party over Saul losing the favor of God and being rejected of leading the children of Israel. And God's like, I got another plan. <laughs> redirecting, amen. Some of you are in a season right now, you're like, you hit the wall. God is saying, I am redirecting your plan. I am changing up some things, amen. But my spirit hasn't changed. My power hasn't changed. My abilities hasn't changed. And so then it, Samuel goes and anoints David. David goes back to feeding the sheep and playing the harp. And then he gets called to the palace to then play the harp. You know, it's funny how David goes, after the anointing, he spends some time doing two things. Serving sheep and worshiping. Serving sheep and worshiping. Sometimes when we get anointed, we just want that congregation. We just want that promotion. We just want that ability to speak in tongues and also um, all the other gifts. But what did David do? Served and worshiped. Served and worshiped. And sometimes we have to minimize the current obstacle and maximize our God. We have to minimize our struggle and maximize the God, our God. And you know what I love? I love that, um, that when David goes um, to, um, to, into his full anointing, he goes to fight Goliath. He, it didn't come without opposition. I mean, he struggled. It did not come without opposition. And so after David is um, playing the harp, Saul and his army, they go to go fight Goliath. There's this big giant who's taunting the, uh, Israel and killing off their people. And so David leaves the palace and he goes home. Um, for after some time, the word of God says, after some time he goes and um, sees his father. And then he goes home and then his father sends him to take some lunch. And he hears this commotion. Think about it. Just like, if you think about like just... Thousands of people, and then in the middle of the battle is a giant taunting, taunting the people of God. And David's like, what's happening? What's cracking? What's going on? And they start saying, nobody can take this. I'm paraphrasing here now. Nobody can take this guy down. And, and he's like, well, what's going to happen if, you know, to whoever, to whoever brings him down? And they said, well, whoever brings him down, they are going to marry the king's daughter. And they are going to have uh, some treasures. And the father won't have to pay taxes. So David's like, shoots, <laughs> shoots, right? Shoots. I love that David had strategy. He was anointed to be king, and he heard a chant from a giant, and then the prize was to marry the king's daughter. You know, David had some, some strategy here. David was listening to God. David was watching for the move of God. Amen? Amen. Church, are you ready to press in? Are you ready to press in? The Bible says in 1 Samuel 17, 15, but David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. You know, right now, if I were David, I would think, gosh, man, that Samuel guy, he's crazy. He gave me a word, and all I'm doing is, is, is feeding sheep and playing the harp. And some of you are thinking, man, I'm anointed to write books, and I'm just working at the Walmart checkout. Some of you are world changers and that's been spoken over you and you're wondering how how is that happening when i'm just teaching children's church how is that going to happen press in you don't forsake your time in the in the sheepfold don't forsake your time in the past the pasture amen because that's what preps you for the for the palace amen come on give god some praise give god some praise we're going to end with this a bullet number three it's not about the giant. It's about who you will become. It's not about the giant. It's about who you're going to become. It's not about the enemy. Listen, I think as a church body, we give way too much recognition to the enemy in our lives. We give way too much credit 
to the enemy. And granted, the enemy has his own agenda, but we got to believe that when we're going through some stuff, when we're going through our struggles, when we don't want to run anymore, when we don't want to fight anymore, that God is trying to pull something out of the inside of us. And the only way that's going to come outside of us is if we're in pressure, if we're in struggle. And yeah, let the devil do his thing, but don't you pay mind to him. You just say, Lord, have your will. Lord, do your thing. Lord, do your thing in my life. Amen. It's about who you're going to become in the process of your fight. It's about who you're going to become in the process of your race. Who you're going to become in the process of you pressing in. Press in now. Amen? And so I love it. They're, the, the, the Israelites are crazy. They, I mean, they are, they're scared and they don't know what to do. And Goliath is just taunting them. And then David goes up and, and he says in 1 Samuel 17, 34, 35. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. I want you to circle the word used. I love that David is talking like he did it like years ago. <laughs> he just came from the sheepfold. Don't you love that, that confidence? They saw, I used to keep sheep. <laughs> and he says, and when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it. And delivered the lamb from its mouth, and when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck it and killed it. Listen, sometimes in order for you to face the struggle that you're in now, you got to remember all the struggles God brought you through. Amen? you got to look behind and look at all the dead bodies that are laying behind you that are from the devil. Amen? And even if you're just starting your faith and you're like, I ain't got no dead bodies around me. Well, look at the dead bodies that are around Pastor Terry. <laughs> look at the dead bodies that are around Roger. Amen? you got to look and ignite your faith because God is faithful. And the very test that you're in right now he had already given you strength to do it he already gave David the ability to tear lions and bears with his bare hands who is this giant coming against the Lord amen I love that David pressed through when his brothers say who what are you doing here what are you doing here little kid I love when Saul said you don't even have a sword you don't even have an armor. Some of you are not walking in your calling because you feel you're not equipped. Listen, I love, I love David's faith. I love that he, when he went after Goliath, he, 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 didn't, he didn't have all of that. And he just had his faith. And a slingshot and some stones. And I love this guy was so cocky. He says, I'm going to bring you down. I'm going to cut off your head. <laughs> you know, I love it. And I was like, if you were so sure that you were going to be able to do this, why did you take five stones? Why, why, why did you take five? Why didn't you just take one, Superman? <laughs> you know why? I think he took five because he didn't know when he was going to come down, but he knew he was going to come down. Amen. <laughs> And so you may have been running the race and you may have fallen left and right. You may have had setbacks. You may have been in some hard situations. You may have been disappointed. You may, somebody may have disappointed you, but you got to keep going. You got to keep going and you got to keep saying, I'm not going to stop because if I stop, that what God has put in me is not going to come out and the world needs it. This is bigger than you. This is bigger than me. You know, when the word says, thou shalt not touch my anointed, it's not for us. It's because what you're anointed, what you're protected to do, when the enemy is coming against you, you say, you're coming against heaven. You're coming against my anointing. You're coming against God's cry for his people. You're not just coming against me. And we need, to stop talk, we need to start talking to our giants, talking to our mountains. We need to stop, start clapping back at the devil, amen? You start saying, you know, uh, things like you're not coming against me. You're coming against God, what God has for this world. You're coming against my God. You're coming against my purpose. We've got to stop saying, tap me out. I ain't going to make it. I need more money. I need more uh, resources. I need more building. I need more church. No, you just need to stop complaining and start getting back in the race. Amen.
In 1 Samuel 17, um, I'm sorry, 1 Samuel 17, 57, 58, and um, um, it says this. Then as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul and the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, whose son are you, young man? You know what really amazes me about that scripture was Saul knew who David was. Just a chapter before, he was asking for someone who can play the harp. And they said it was Jesse. And, and, and Saul, Saul asked, you know, Jesse for his son, sent messengers to send Jesse, um, David, to um, the palace to play for him. David stood before Saul. So why in the world is Saul asking, whose son are you? You know, I think sometimes we forget that we have a heavenly father. And the fact that Saul asked David that, he wasn't asking, you know, what lineage do you come from? What hood do you come from? What side of town do you come from? He wasn't asking that. He was saying, whose son are you? There was something he saw in David this time that was not there before. And we have to in order to finish our race in order to press in for the finish we need to start tapping in to who our father is in his strength stop tapping into our strength because that's limited stop tapping into our knowledge because that's limited stop tapping into what we know because that's limited we're going to run out but his supply is endless amen amen, amen. And so, church, when struggle comes your way, you got to be sure that you um, birth your destiny versus stagnancy. Amen? 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 You don't choose. God chooses you. And anointed now does not mean, anointed does not mean right now. Don't get tired of serving and worshiping. Don't get tired of serving and worshiping. Don't get tired of that. Amen? All right, will you rise to your feet and we'll pray.